Hi guys, and welcome back to the podcast. Um, today, I'm delighted to welcome on Dr. Cullum Doody. He's a researcher out of uh, NUI Galway. It's focused around resilience, psychologists. So, Cullum, thanks a million for jumping on. Good morning, Robbie. Yeah, thanks very, thanks very much for having me uh, on the podcast. Now, we've talked about this in various different forms uh, going, going way back. So it's nice, nice to be here this morning with you. Oh, good, good. Yeah, geez, it's a long time since we, since we discussed it. It's about time that we came around to it as well. But uh, what I'll do is I'll get you to introduce yourself, maybe talk about some of the stuff that you've been looking at the last five years, if I'm right in saying. <laughs> yeah, can... yeah, just about, yeah. Jesus, yeah. And um, yeah, so do you want to give a brief introduction of what it is and, and what you do and what your focus is? Yeah, so my name is Colm Judy, as you said there. I'm a uh, rec- recently finished PhD student um, in out of NUI Galway in the School of Psychology. <clears throat> so my research basically for the last four and a bit, just under five years, unfortunately, with COVID, was looking at uh, working with the Defence Forces, the Irish Army, Navy, Air Corps, um, at developing a, I suppose, a pre-deployment resilience building programme. Uh, so as people may or may not know, our members are Defence Forces across the three branches uh, would be deployed to maybe foreign missions, might go to Lebanon, to Syria, the Navy could be on coastal patrols, or they could be as in like in the last decade, there would have been a lot of work around the Mediterranean migrant crisis. And then we have our Air Corps who, some, some members of the Air Corps might deploy overseas, maybe more in an infantry or a staff officer role. But in Ireland, particularly, we looked at the emergency air medical service. So Anyone who lives around Galway, Athlone, and Dublin, you'll see the helicopter, the Army, or the, the Air Corps helicopter going over. That's a lot of patient transfers or, or responding to accidents. So basically, we want to look at, based on these people's experiences, and I suppose maybe that the experiential stuff came out later in the PhD, but basically, is there something we could do before our personnel, men and women, are, are deployed into these situations that we could preemptively build their resilience? So if they witness something or they maybe found something tough to deal with, they did have maybe some skills or the knowledge to deal with that and have maybe uh, better protection from any potential negative mental health outcomes or, or, or different diagnoses that can happen in response and very, very normally can happen uh, after somebody's exper- experiences a potentially traumatic event. So that's kind of where, where the, the basis of the project. Um, there was four constituent papers, so... PhD in Galway and in the School of Psychology, typically it's, it's about three papers, depending on like, just different formats, you can do a PhD by publication or by thesis, not to bore your audience, but there's four basic, it was four basically building blocks in that. Um, so we followed the Medical Research Council's guidelines for the development and evaluation of complex interventions. Uh, so we looked at, basically we did a big systematic review at the start, Cochrane Review. <clears throat> uh, so this was essentially we want to look at what has been done internationally in military kind of environments to build resilience. Um, But we also looked at blue light emergency services. I suppose the reason we included those kind of populations was if you look at some of the issues that humanitarian peacekeeping mission, a soldier, say, serving out in Lebanon or Syria, uh, a lot of their work could be arriving on the scene of, of maybe a tragedy that's happened. Um, a kind of a ballpark idea of that. So that's something that emergency services would have to deal with a lot as well. So um, it hadn't been done. There hadn't been a big um, uh, systematic review, specifically a Cochrane review, which is typically would be used in medical trials, but it can be used in psychological interventions as well. Um, so it's just like, I suppose it's a high grade. It's a high, um, I suppose the, the idea of a Cochrane is the findings of the Cochrane would be of a high standard and it goes, yeah. it's quite met- methodologically rigorous, I suppose, yeah, um, the highest standard really isn't it when you're looking at the Cochrane yeah look they, it had, they, if, if you're doing a Cochrane and uh, it nearly took the full four years to do so they're a huge, <laughs> they're a huge undertaking if anyone out there is thinking of doing one uh, I think I have a long hard thing it's great <laughs> it's done like look it, it's it's something and we can maybe come back to it later in the podcast with a lot of resilience building work especially in militaries worldwide there is kind of Controversy might be too strong a word, but for example, you look at the U.S. Army uses the, the or they did anyways, the Comprehensive Soldier Fitness Program that was developed by Martin Seligman, who your listeners may be aware of, is involved in positive kind of psychology, positive, or the psychology of happiness, that kind of ballpark. Um, and just some of the funding, how that was allocated to that program, um, 
you know, there was supposed to be a tender process for that. I won't get into it too much. There was direct funds put into certain people's accounts. And what ended up is, is, is what ended up the product was the largest ever targeted psychological intervention, regardless of what field ever, um, over, I think, 1.2 million um, test subjects um, in the US, US Army personnel. Um, and what we can tell, it has nothing has been published really, the transparency on it isn't great, but it looks like the program was never tested and it looks like the program doesn't work. Uh, really so that's like that. ballpark 30 million. So that's a little bit of an issue around some of the, the literature in uh, military <clears throat> resilience building is where the funding comes from. So if own militaries are funding their own personnel to develop interventions, well, is there a bias then that this program needs to work because 20 million has gone into it? Yeah. Um, so, and look, that's, that's a bias that exists throughout science, um, depending where the money comes from, is there a risk, a risk of bias? So look, that was some of the motivation to do the Cochrane review, I suppose, to really um, dig deep into kind of some of the methodological rigor of the current programs that are used, look at the risk of bias of, of, at different domains and how the programs were being run. So the idea was that at the end, we could have maybe a firm, uh, I suppose, piece that could tell us what type of resilience building program works, what doesn't work, um, and maybe what, what is something that we should use looking forward for, uh, I suppose, in the Irish context, what would work. Uh, so the findings of that were actually quite interesting in that we couldn't offer, uh, we couldn't offer a firm, I suppose, we couldn't offer a firm uh, conclusion on what works and what doesn't work in resilience. So when we had a look, uh, we had about 28 papers that actually, I suppose, met the conclusion criteria for what we were looking at. So we were looking at randomized controlled trials. So it's basically, uh, it's, that your participant pool is maybe equally randomized to an experimental group and then a control group. So you're comparing, I suppose, your, 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 your new intervention with people who aren't improving it. Just, I suppose, it's a higher, higher rigor standard of trial as opposed to a quasi-experimental or observational or whatever. Um, so we found that there's a lot of different uh, ways that people are, 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 scientists are trying to build resilience. So you might have CBT informed programs, so cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, there can be, I suppose, kind of like a stress reduction or stress resistance or stress exposure training. Uh, there'll be mindfulness based uh, interventions, uh, and some interventions then took took a blend. Like even just to, I suppose, to highlight the difference, the different aspects or the different approaches that people are taking to resilience. There'll be like psychoeducational, I suppose that arguably maybe a more straightforward approach and would be this idea of maybe learning about stress, learning about resilience through a PowerPoint presentation. That's very simplistic view, but that's roughly kind of maybe what a psychoeducational piece would look like. And then on the other end of the spectrum resilience, you'd have things like cognitive biofeedback training, where you're getting people to develop their own strategies for maybe regulating their heart rate variabilities that could be through breathing or maybe different cognitive techniques. So building resilience to stress, and that might involve somebody practicing those techniques, doing simulation training where it might be with the police, they might have a, a they might run a, I suppose, a simulated bank robbery or a simulated car crash, and you're getting people to use those skills, or it could be a computer based where somebody might have a character on a screen, they're sitting there and the character will only maybe jump or walk if they're if that person is using their if they're using those cognitive or physical strategies to actually right. lower their heart rate in the second so okay. just it's really it's really it's a really interesting field um and the problem was with such variance in the way resilience was being you are there sorry it was being targeted we couldn't go in and do a meta-analysis so it'd be very difficult to compare a psychoeducational program to that idea of somebody, you know, using their heart rate to move character. They're just, it's like yeah. comparing apples and oranges. Um, so very, very difficult. It was, an in, it was just interesting. And I suppose it was a good snapshot of where the field of resilience is at, that it is still such a broad field. The term resilience as well means a lot of different things. For I was going to say, yeah. what, it, what just to, to kind of, to, so people have a better idea, like what, what, what is resilience or what is one definition of resilience uh, as well as what qualities would one show uh, that they are more, more resilient or someone who is not very resilient? Yeah, I suppose, look, to take it, take it in parts, I think, I suppose, 
and this was something maybe we've talked about as well, how the, the conceptualization of resilience has changed over time. So the concept of resilience or the, the operationalization opera, of resilience that I would have used through the PhD would have been it's this dynamic uh, state. So basically, it's a simpler definition of resilience is your ability to successfully adapt to and overcome basically life's challenges or this idea that something happens to you and you're able to bounce back, I suppose, effectively from it. So then it's, I suppose, it comes to the argument, well, is resilience something that you're born with or is resilience something that, um, I suppose, is dynamic and changes over, over time? And I think probably the answer is, like a lot of things in psychology, is probably somewhere in the middle with a leaning towards this idea of, of the dynamic state of resilience. So based on a lot, like a, a lot of, I suppose, fixed, fixed traits, that you're born with, it could be, um, you know, things like your upbringing, your uh, family situation, your um, different things like your intelligence level, they're all predictive of, I suppose, your overall resilience. And look, there's a lot of things when you, you can't, you can't change a lot of those things. But uh, if you look at it from the skills based point of view, so the dynamic side, okay, there might be some fixed rates, but throughout our lives, through overcoming various different challenges, through building our social, I suppose, our social connectivity, our social circles, our social support, um, coping strategies, communication skills, etc., that you can build your own resilience. And whilst there may be this baseline, different baselines for different people, they might have, a, I suppose, the initial level of resilience, that really it is something that is dynamic and changes over the course of the life. Um, so I think that's I think that's a really positive message about resilience is it's not you're not resilient or you are resilient. It's something that is, I suppose, this idea of dynamic and will change and will fluctuate. It'll go up and down depending on life events that happen in your life, um, you know, yourself. Like I think of an interesting way to think about it is think of the last time that you uh, didn't get a full night's sleep and the next day you're cranky yeah. and things are more difficult. And if you were to get bad news after having a night's sleep, that might, you might find it more difficult to deal with that in the moment. That's a really simplified, um, I suppose that's a really simplified uh, view on it. But I think that shows that there is a dynamism of resilience. Definitely. Yeah. You know, that it's something that different factors will work together and your resilience at different points in your life is going to be higher, it's going to be lower, uh, but it's always changing. And I think uh, it's important to say that it's something that you can, you can definitely focus on from a myriad of different, uh, of different ways. Yeah, yeah. And it, it comes back to as well, just as you were saying there, the, your night's sleep and if you had bad news the next day, what I often see with people who have, let's say, recurring injuries or, or longer term injuries, especially the ones that are would have happened initially, like it could have been an embarrassing situation or uh, probably an easier example is like a whiplash after a road traffic accident where the initial injury heals up. But the emotional side of it, the, the, the fact that they were in a car crash, maybe there was people injured in it, maybe it was it, it was fatal injuries in it it's very difficult to let that go. And as a mm. result, and you'll see that it actually shows up on the nervous system and that they'll be a lot more sensitive to pain. And when they get back into care or when they start thinking about long journeys, things like that, that the pain will start to flare up again and kick up again. But if you add that into the fact that maybe if the night before they didn't have great sleep, maybe they had, they were, they were stressing over a few different things. They had, uh, they just weren't in a good mental state when it happened. It's a lot more likely that that's going to stick around. Uh, and you see it with car crashes you see it when there's someone who gets an injury around the time that there's a death in the family as well, and um, that 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 really sticks on longer. Yeah, absolutely. I think look, <clears throat> the sleep idea, the sleep, I suppose, is quite a simplistic term, but I think what you said there about um, you know if there's a death in the family or you've had some really bad news or you've just been fired and then there's something happens is almost like this, it's like this compounding effect of that life stressor. Um, and I think you had you had a, a recent enough guest who talked about this idea of the bowl and resilience in, in the bowl and it yeah. up and it maybe goes over the top. Um, that's where like, I suppose to the idea of chronic, chronic, chronic stress as a debilitator of your resilience and leaving you more susceptible to at, at the at one end of the extreme, maybe a diagnosis of PTSD later, I think is, is an important point that actually kind of brings me on nicely um, to back to plug a little bit of my own research. The second uh, stage of the PhD was so we had this idea from the first the first paper that, okay we can't really say what resilience building intervention is best we can't really say that but what we could tell was 
that programs maybe that had a CBT or had a mindfulness or a stress reduction approach, they appeared to have efficacy in their in their their client population. So be that military or emergency service. So we knew that there was kind of there was definitely something there, but we couldn't, I suppose, go out and say in the literature. <clears throat> If you do a stress resilience intervention, it will build resilience. We couldn't go that far, but we knew that there was there was definitely scope. So the second part, so that would gave us, I suppose, largely, it gave us, it, I suppose, a, a global picture of the field of resilience in in the military domain. But what it didn't tell us was specific to, <clears throat> excuse me, the Irish Defence Forces. Okay, but what's their experience of deployment? Uh, you know, what, what, what does the average sailor when they deployed to Operation Pontus down the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean uh, migrant rescues, what's that experience like before they go, while they're there, and when they come back? So looking at the three phases. Um, and the big thing that came up, and just to go back to this idea of the compound or the chronic stress, um, was, so most of the people we interviewed, so I think we had 12 across the three branches, uh, most of them would have reported something that you or I, I suppose, if it happened to us in our day to day, would say, yeah, that that, that could be a tra traumatizing event or what we call a potentially traumatic event. Um, so that could be things like in, you know, with the army that there might have been explosions close to the camp or that they maybe would have witnessed something through the binoculars, acts of terror against maybe local populations. So the Navy was dealing with deceased migrants in the Mediterranean. Yeah, and I was reading some of them. Oh, oh it's it's yeah there's i think there is there is an rt documentary on it um it's probably out in the archive somewhere but it, i suppose it gives it gives a picture of what it was like but when you actually hear the stories it's quite it was quite harrowing and i don't think that's something that really is 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 that out in the public domain how intense some of those missions missions were and then even if you look at the uh, the air corps service they're dealing with um different types of injury, different types of mechanism and injury, be that in the pilot or the air crew. Um, so they're experiencing these potentially traumatic events, but the big issue for Irish personnel was actually the day-to-day -day chronic stress and how that could build up over time. So they might be deployed in the Middle East, but they're still dealing with the same chronic stress that you or I might face. So you're not getting on with your roommate or you're not getting on with your parents or there's your boss is giving you a hassle or there's a bad work environment or um, now this is, wasn't true for everyone, but it's true in any job that you're going to have these little stresses and strains. And then when you're taken out of maybe your family structure at home, which are offer you a lot of social support, social support is a buzzword I've thrown around a few times, very important resilience and trauma. Um, you're taken out of that environment. You're put into, let's say, a military camp for six months um so things are going to just be under the uh, the microscope it's going to be a little bit more magnified um so that was really the big issue for for irish defense forces personnel was that idea of chronic stress um while they were serving um not being able to maybe relate that to their family back home uh, and then the i suppose attention uh when personnel would actually come back from deployment and come back into their, you know, I suppose their, their normal life. Um, so if you look at it, like the idea of modern military deployments, um, if you look back even towards Roman times or even, even longer, an army would have gone on campaign for months, perhaps even years, years at a time. So they might be involved in a battle or whatever, um, you know, if it was a, it's somewhere in France and it would take X amount of weeks or months for that, uh, that Roman army to come back, for example, during that time, you're with the same people who've experienced that potentially traumatic event. You're talking about, you're dealing with it, blah, blah, blah. And you come back home. Okay, grand. Now, we do, we do have accounts of, <clears throat> of PTSD from, from historic times. So that's not the only factor. If you look at a modern deployment, you could be essentially anywhere in the world and, even, uh, and hop on a plane and be home potentially within a day. So you've gone out of the, and, and most of the time it was different during COVID, but when you come back from a deployment, pretty much straight away, you go back into your, your family. Um, but what's happened there is your social support structure that you've developed while overseas. So it might be your platoon or your section or your company or whatever it is. Um, they've all gone back home as well. So now you've lost your, that social support structure. You've been put into back into your home 
support structure or you know maybe you're single or I don't know it depends on 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 people's um, uh, own circumstances but you've gone out with that social support into with a group of people who haven't shared that same experience with you and that can be quite a, a in fact a very jarring experience for people um it actually it 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 fits into this idea of homecoming theory so when you've deployed you've had 6 months of your reality that is very different to the reality that your family has had for those six months. You come back and it's like the idea, and it came up in the interviews, this idea of the bubble bursting. So you come back in, your social support is gone. There's also maybe this pressure that you've been gone and now you've come back and you should be delighted to be back and you should be delighted to be with your family. And a lot of times personnel have, they're very happy to be home, but there's conflict that maybe they miss the routine is completely different. They might miss their, their friends or that they might have had some artifacts, mental artifacts that have, from things they might have seen that they're now starting to deal with now that they're out of that scenario. So it's, 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 it's a very complex, um, it's a very complex, I suppose, phenomenon, that idea of the deployment cycle. But it's just interesting, the idea of the chronic stress um, is being, being, being a huge issue as well. And when you... Yeah, and I, I actually remember reading because I, I, I got to read bits of the thesis only. Jesus, it's a long one, so I don't know if I could get through the whole thing of it. But, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sorry for you. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I didn't read any of it. Uh, and I saw you, or I, I noticed on one point, it was, it was like 98% of people after World War II for the special forces that had been out for over 60 days had all shown some form of, mm. of, of uh, PTSD. So obviously I can imagine that just it, it, it or breaking at you every day that it's always going to have that effect on you and at a certain stage you can only be so resilient. It's the same with training. You can only mm. train for so long before you'll actually start to break down. When you look at social sports, because I, I want to kind of keep it as well. So like looking at social sport from a, from a military personnel uh, side of things where they're all together and they come home to their family. I know it's a, it can be the same with, uh, even with people that, like when they go to college and they come home and different experiences, stuff like that. How does the social sport actually help? Is it the bit, it's just talking? Is it communicating? Is it that the camaraderie of it? How does it, the social sport, sport come into it? Yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good uh, question, Robbie. I think, I think, I suppose a lot of talk, talk ther- without being a clinician, a lot of talk therapies in psychology, a lot of it is to do with, I suppose, almost putting your thoughts or taking your thoughts maybe about a, a situation, getting them out of your head, I suppose, verbalizing them, getting them out of there. Uh, a lot of that as well, if you have a problem, you know yourself, you have a problem and you speak to somebody else about it, you know, that there's that, you can get validation for how you're feeling. So yeah. I suppose this idea of that you're not being, oh, I'm weak because I feel stressed or I feel sad after I experience this. Somebody else, I suppose, gives you that social support where I suppose they can validate your feelings, maybe that reduction in stigma that you don't feel stigmatized, which I think is really important. Other issues maybe around shame or guilt that you're feeling a certain way of your experience something. Again, that that can be validated through through speaking with other people. And even then, if you look at it from an evolutionary point of view, um, like humans were not, we, we definitely live, I suppose, in the Western, in the Western world, it's, we've moved towards this individualistic, um, I suppose, society. But really from evolutionary point of view, we're, we're not built to be, we're not really built to be individuals. We're, be- we're built to operate within social groups or social circles. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's without, without being an absolute expert on the social support side, like it is functioning within social groups is just, it is vital. It is vital for humans. Even look at, there's like, there's research looked at a loneliness in older adults and simply things like having even for adults, older adults living on their own, even to have a, a plant or something or focus uh, or, a, or a, even a pet increases lifespan. And I think that without being an expert on that side of thing, I think that's that's really telling on, on the role of social support. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. But you know yourself, it's like that old adage of a problem shared is a problem halved. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting as well, the, the jarring issue with social support for military personnel is that they've gone through those shared experiences and they've witnessed maybe if they're at section level which would be like a squad level i'd say for 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 the irish army um those are the people you're going to be if you're going out in patrols they're the people you're going to be with you're going to experience uh essentially the same the same phenomenon or the same same events 
So that's seven people or eight, nine people, whatever, who have the same experiences as you and you can talk it through. I think there's an interesting stuff work around, around trauma as well in when somebody's exposed to a traumatic event, how sometimes the way the memory can be encoded, uh, there can be issues, or I suppose there can be, there's, let's say there's the dual representation model um, which, which Bruin would have argued it's one of the, uh, not the only model of PTSD or trauma, but is one of them. We talk about how there's these two ideas of your verbally accessible memories and your situationally access, accessible memories. Hmm. So when somebody maybe experiences a trauma, uh, those verbally accessible memories, so the idea kind of things you could talk about the event, uh, that they might split in the consciousness or there might be kind of like a corruption in the consciousness between your VAMs, your, your verbally accessible memories, and then your situational accessible memories. So that'd be things like, like you'd see in the movies, like somebody hears a loud bang and they have a flashback or they s- smell a certain smell and it brings them back to the traumatic memory. So even things like social support, and I suppose talking through at a very simplistic level can sometimes help people create that narrative, fit, in, fit the event into their worldview. A lot of the work around trauma as well would say, that when something traumatic or potentially traumatic happens, I suppose it might be jarring to our worldview. We might have worldviews, especially growing up in Ireland, that the world is a safe place, that, you know, I am safe from danger. Um, I know even though, like people at a young age, like uh, that, you know, I, you know, I won't die until I'm 80. That might be an idea you have about yourself. You maybe a consciously or subconsciously think about it. Yeah. Then you're involved in something like a car crash. And all of a sudden those, you're kind of grounding conceptions of the world might be shattered. Okay, well, I'm not invincible. Um, the world maybe isn't a safe place. Um, so then the issue then around yeah, your that your SAMs and your VAMs, that, that that can be, uh, I suppose the link between them can be a little bit disjointed. And then for your social support, look, that you might have that validated and maybe talking through it, that you can push that event into, I suppose, a narrative and it helps you, I suppose, process the event. Um, so without being a clinician and not having actually, I suppose, dealt with clients like that, um, I would have, I suppose, an academic and I would say not a, a very, <laughs> I wouldn't be incredibly well versed on that side, but that would be my understanding of maybe some of those processes yeah. uh, that can happen. Jeez, man, well put. Um, Cause yeah, I think that's it. Exactly. And I was just, when you were saying that about somebody who were saying like that, how your world, you would change after an accident or after being put in a certain situation. I wonder, is there, and I, I don't know if you ever, if you had seen any research on it, is there any connection between childhood, uh, let's say, traumas that people had, mm. um, overcoming certain childhood traumas, and how that played onto the resilience as they got older, or even, like, in the military? Yeah, like, <clears throat> again, without being a, a, a huge ex- expert on maybe some of the childhood trauma, um, when you chart back, I suppose, our understanding of trauma throughout history, the idea of, I suppose, early childhood uh, trauma as being a predictor for maybe for negative outcomes later in life, like that's, that, that would have been historically a big, I suppose, grounding point in trauma theory. And definitely there would be some research uh, to suggest if you're, as a child, like most of our, again, it comes back, most of our conceptualizations of the world, a lot of our coping skills, um, a lot of us are, are, are even are the way we view the world, our schema of the schemata of the world is formed during childhood. So if mm. you're exposed to uh, it could be, you know, negative events in your childhood, look that that can have, um, I suppose it can have a negative effect. And I suppose it's not, again, I come back to this idea of your trait versus dynamic uh, conceptualization of resilience. So if that happens in your childhood, <clears throat> maybe some of those early I suppose building blocks of your, your lifetime resilience, I suppose that might be, I don't use the word damage because that sounds a bit stigmatizing, um, but maybe it's not giving you the best start in your resilience. But this whole idea of the dynamic model of resilience is that, okay, everyone has that different starting point, but here's things that you can work on and here's different skills or knowledge or coping skills uh, or using your social support that can build up your resilience later in life. So Look, it's like childhood is so important. It's, it's, it's the cornerstone of a lot of adult psychology and a lot of adult mental health. But, you know, it's absolutely, it's absolutely not. If you have bad childhood experience, that's not to say that you're not going to go on and live a full and happy life. Absolutely not. Um, and again, look, that's not something I'm an expert in, so I don't want to 
talk about it too too much because it, it can be a very sensitive topic for people. Definitely. Um, do, do you know, Robbie? Yeah. Okay, guys. Um, sorry, we got cut off there, so we're going to jump back into it. So basically, Colin, we, we've, we've talked through everything now uh, in terms of resilience, uh, why it's needed. I was going to ask you about certain qualities that are inherent in, in people who are more resilient. What I wanted to look at then, I suppose, is like coping strategies at the minute. Now, I don't know if I can, well, I just, if I can leave it open and, and, and you go down that route, but is there certain qualities that you see in certain people and you can say, oh, they're going to be more resilient? Is there certain coping strategies that you find that people use consistently when they come under duress or come into distress? Have you seen anything like that in, in your work? Hmm. I think, and I think I suppose it kind of comes back to this idea we've been talking about the dynamic model of resilience that certain people based on their life experience experiences up to that point are going to be more resilient in certain situations than other people. So imagine like even just from a footballer like if they've played in three all Ireland finals, <laughs> unless you're Mayo, you'd imagine <laughs> they're going to be more resilient, maybe, or maybe a better able to deal with that pressure um, than maybe a new player who's never played in that before. No Simply abuse to the Mayo fans. Their, no, no, <laughs> they, all abuse to the Mayo fans. Um, um, do you know, do they have more experience of that compared to somebody who maybe doesn't? So like, yeah. I think an interesting, an interesting way of looking at resilience as well is like, you know, the more challenges or the more things you can overcome in your life, um, and that doesn't have to be like major traumas, it can be even just little challenges for yourself, um, you know, the, the next stage becomes easier. Like, imagine if you uh, were, were a runner and you said, I'd never be able to do, uh, you know, half, let's say five kilometers, but you went out and you felt good and you ran six, but all of a sudden five doesn't seem so tricky anymore. Yeah. So it's like this idea of if you can so keep pushing your upward boundary, and this is more maybe a, a mindset thing, if you keep pushing your upper boundary of what you can do or what you can achieve, well, all of a sudden, anything below that seems easy. It's within it's within your grasp. And that's probably something for, for sports people as well to think about. Um, so that's uh, sorry, what I was saying. Yeah, so I think to look at people maybe who are resilient or more are, are, are maybe we will find some, some things more difficult. I'm even just reflecting on some of the own research I did with military personnel, like some of the coping strategies that they would have used. And it's like, again, it was through the military lens, but I think it's, it's people in general. So like that supposed the idea of decompression uh, was a big thing. So when something happened, it was this idea again of the social support that they would have talked through with the other people in there, I suppose, immediate, uh, again, the idea of the section or the squad, that that was a big thing they would have talked it through, that they would have reached out, some cases, to family or friends or their partners, just to talk it through and have that somebody to, I suppose, yeah, take away that stigma of what's happened, like, oh, I felt sad when this happened and I yeah. shouldn't feel sad because I'm a man. There was a bit of that, but they were using their partners or their, their family you know, to say this and they, you know, getting that reinforcement or getting that, that positive belief or positive um, affirmation, I suppose, in a way. Another big thing as well that came up was, and again, maybe this is more military specific, but maybe comes back to this idea of you hear people say, what's your why? What's your why for mm. doing something? And one of the big protective things for military personnel when they were serving on the missions was their why so they, they had a big belief in that they were out there doing good particularly in the Mediterranean it was a big thing that they were you know the, the Irish Navy and I don't think they get enough appreciation for the countless lives they saved during that Mediterranean migrant crisis um, countless countless lives um, but that was something that they were out there while it was very very difficult and some of the things they witnessed were were quite extreme and that they had belief in the mission and they knew they were doing well I suppose that galvanized them uh, to keep going and to, like, if you look at, in that kind of context, what does resilience mean? Um, like, these are people who are being exposed to potentially repeated traumatic events, which we know is very, very dangerous uh, for pe putting people at risk for maybe a diagnosis of PTSD or other significant mental health outcomes. So in that context, resilience for them was they couldn't change the situation they were in, um, but I suppose it was to be able to you know, have that belief in themselves, belief in the mission, knew they were doing uh, doing well, and it was to keep for that in that context, resilience was being able to keep going despite the the huge dresses and trains. 
now and this might be something we can talk about later I suppose this idea of resilience of being like there might be this this idea that resilience is simply your ab- your ability to stay going and to keep going despite what's being thrown at you um whereas you know what's the ethics around that from an organizational point of view um and maybe that's something we maybe we'd, we'd want to come back to um but yeah it's, it's, it's this idea of the individualistic versus maybe a more holistic model of resilience okay okay yeah definitely i'll jump into that in a second but when you just when you were talking about that about your purpose and your and your why it actually i was reading that book man's search for meaning recently and he talks about that a lot and i, I suppose that is very similar to some of the stuff that he talks about in that is that the people who had a why and had a purpose and had a, a reason to continue on, especially in the concentration camps, they were always the ones who were able to continue. He said, but you'd know straight away uh, in the morning when someone wouldn't get up out of bed, uh, when told by the guards that uh, they had to get up and instead they just pulled out a cigarette and started smoking a cigarette. He said, you usually see within two to three days that um, they'd, they'd usually die. Now, obviously there's, mm. there's, there's a couple of situations. They didn't. It wasn't all their own uh, choice either. In, yeah, in who was no, chosen? Of course, of course. But um, um it's an interesting. Yeah, Victor. I I I actually audio booked. I'm a devil for audio books. I I find oh, I love so them. hard to to sit down and read a book. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, which probably sounds a bit weird for somebody in my profession. I was going to say I'm not, not been great at reading. <laughs> uh, but uh, Victor Frankel's over COVID. I actually listened to Victor Frankel's that the the man search for meaning. And it's like that was actually something that I found really useful during COVID because look, COVID for everyone, we were lucky in my family. We had nobody really got sick. We had nobody maybe who was at high risk. So we were, I suppose, we were in a pretty good position that I didn't have a huge amount to worry about. Um, you know, and look, some people had, had a lot more serious stuff going on during that time. But still, look, for anyone, for, for even somebody in the best position, COVID was undeniably <clears throat> very, very difficult, very, very stressful. Um, but for me, like, I, I remember reading that book and thinking like, right, what's, what's the meaning of this suffering for me or the COVID suffering? And for me, it was that there was no distractions and that I could actually sit down and, and start to write, write my thesis. Um, so that was definitely something for myself just to reflect on it. Um, that was one of the positives and like, there was very few positives of COVID. Uh, but for me personally, that's what I took out of it. And that was definitely something really really helped me i think even like you know so i'd be involved with the in my my spare time i'd be uh, uh, an officer in the, the army reserve and it's definitely sometimes when we'd be doing some of the more physical training or the, the, the more the maybe some of the you know maybe the longer exercises and you're thinking right this is really difficult and then it's like what's your what's your meaning or what's the meaning of the suffering is okay that i'm able to do this patrol i'm able to lead this patrol under yeah. huge amount of stress so if i ever did have to to do it okay that i, I know that i can do it and it comes back yeah. to the idea of building your your stress re, stress resilience or you're building your like building those building blocks of i've overcome this challenge this challenge this challenge so now the next challenge will i have those coping skills i've honed my coping skills or yeah. i've honed my certain different abilities from those other challenges so when i face the next challenge okay, here's the learnings that I've had from A, B, C, and D. And then your next thing, you're, it's easier to adapt to. That would just be, I suppose, one aspect, one way that you can look at it. And do you feel that that comes with reflection then on actually reflecting on, on the challenges that you've overcome and the obstacles that you've overcome, um, as well as like you have done it subconsciously, you know you've done it. But do you feel yeah. that on reflection that helps a good bit as well? Yeah, I think I think some people have a bit of an aversion to reflecting on things they've done right or they've done wrong. But like if you look at like if you look at in the corporate world, like there'll always be a lot of the times there'll be an action after action report or we've done this, yeah. what are our learnings? You look at the military and like you know, okay, look at it from any of a lot of fucking war films, and it's like they'll do like the deep well, you need to come in for your debrief. Um, or they do the debrief, <laughs> you know. But the but the whole idea of that, the whole idea of the after action report is that okay, let's see how we performed, what was good, what was bad. Um, but a lot of the times we don't, we might necessarily do that for ourselves, or yeah. even worse, we'll go, oh geez, I did that, and here's all the things I did terribly. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's that we have this. I think Irish people in, in particular, we have this. I don't know where it comes from, but we'll often focus on our negatives whereas maybe other cultures you'll see um people are all about thinking about what they did well what they did well what they did positively 
Or I think in Ireland we can be we can be victims of catastrophizing after an event. Like God, I did that interview and I said these ten stupid things. Like I'll yeah. probably go off after this podcast and say I can't believe I said that. <laughs> you know, we're di- we're different, but that 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 degrades then maybe the you know the nine out of ten things that you were happy with. Yeah. Um, so I think I think self reflection is it's a huge tool and it's the absolute cornerstone of um, a lot of practical psychology as as a therapist again I, I i'm not a therapist or i'm not a clinical psychologist i have some clinical experience but one of the main things in clinical psychology is your use of supervision so you might uh, work with clients you might run an intervention group and then you'll go essentially to your line manager or so you might be a more senior clinical psychologist and you'll talk through like there's different, there's loads of different models, like the Gibbs reflective uh, yeah. model. Oh, I know. Um, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you for yeah, every project you know I ever did? <laughs> oh, stop. But, but you know yourself, it's like basically what was good, what was bad, what can be improved, what do we do next? You know, it's yeah. that kind of idea. Um, so it's a huge cornerstone of clinical psychology, but it's maybe not something that we do ourselves after an event. So there's a lot of learnings. Um, and look, there's always going to be good. There's always going to be things that are bad. It's how you can take those and take those learnings into the next challenge you face. Okay. Last time, last time I did, I went out and played a game. Let's say I caught nine out of 10 balls, but after that 10th ball, it took my eye off the ball. Do you know, okay. There's yeah. a little reflection. The next time that's not going to happen. Now that's not really resilience. It's kind of more of a sports analogy. But I think like how you deal with events or, or, or anything that comes up in your life. Look, if you, if you can reflect on it at all and take some learnings out of it, well, then you've gotten, you've found your meaning in it, you've found your benefit. Okay, that went badly, but the next time I'm not going to, you know, that's not going to happen to me again. Yeah. Or if something bad does happen, well, it's not really that bad. You know, if you say something wrong in an interview, look, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, and maybe exactly. to have that self-compassion. Um, it's like another thing that Viktor Frankl talks about in his book. Um, I think it's like, I don't know if there's any evidence behind it, but I always find it interesting. It's whatever you put your energy into, you know, if you if you're given a presentation, you're like, I don't want to make a mistake. And that's what you're thinking about. Well, you probably will make yeah. a mistake. Yeah. So it's what you put your, maybe put your energy into can be important as well. Yeah. Uh, he does. He talks about that and flipping it for people as well. I remember there's yeah. one, there was one, he talked about one case where there was a guy who was sweating and what he uses, he, he sweat, he sweated when he came under pressure and the way they counteracted that was, by him making jokes about how much he sweated when he came under pressure and they found that that was able to reverse it. But looking on then, I know it's actually keeping it in the military uh, side Mm -hmm. of things is that because I think a lot of the stuff that you talk about is very applicable to sports. I know it's a lot of the sports population that will listen to this podcast, but I think it's very applicable to that as well. They were, I remember we we were talking about just before it about the Navy SEALs and mm. using goal setting um, as a way to be more resilient and as a way to kind of cope or as a coping mechanism, I suppose, more so than a to become more resilient. And they found that the people who were able to get through Hell Week were the ones who were able to set minor goals of what they had to get to and what they had to get through. Uh, is that something that you've come across or looked into yourself or have you heard about it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea of goal setting, well, like it, again, it's another kind of you hear people talk about goal setting buzzword, but what does that, that really mean? Like from my own experience, we'll say, um, and this is like, this is a really simplistic one of two examples. So I was just before we came on, we we're talking about that I'm doing that that project, and I have to screen for a systematic view. I have to screen like seventeen thousand papers, and I sat down last week to start to do it, and I was just looking at the number going down one by one by one, or like doing blocks at a time. I think God, I'm never going to get seventeen thousand. I'm never, like that's impossible. Oh. Never going to do it. But then it's like even just really just a little mental flip and I was like right I'll get to 500 now in the next 10 minutes and then I'll go and make a coffee yeah and it's yeah, like yeah. it's like it's like how do you eat an elephant piece by piece it's that like idea of chunking um so once I once I just kind of flipped the mindset on it a bit and broke it down into like the smallest like if you break things down to the small smallest um like the smallest amount that you can't fail well, then you've got to win. So I got 500. It's like, oh yeah, grand, but you're, I actually don't need that coffee for another 10 minutes. I'll do another 500. All of yeah. a sudden that's a thousand done in, let's say, you know, what maybe would have taken me a couple of hours. I've gotten done maybe in an hour and all of a sudden, okay, well that's, you know, that's 70, like one seven or 
you know, my maths let me down. One thousand is, is is you know is a decent percentage of seventeen thousand. Yeah. You know, so it's like okay, so that's a little goal setting technique. So you're doing the smallest amount that can't fail. And I think we talk about building like this idea maybe of building on previous successes and the the compounding effect of 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 success. The same way stress can compound. You get like this idea of momentum. Turn yourself. You're going to the gym. And sometimes the hardest, the hardest gym session I find <clears throat> is the one after, you know, you've gone on holidays or you've gone, oh, out for, you've gone out for a few big drinks with the lads and you've had your takeaway the next day and you're feeling sorry for yourself. And then all of a sudden it's a week's gone by and you haven't gone to the gym. And the hardest one is the one to get back. And then you go back to the second one. It's like, all right, the momentum builds. You go back to the third one and then you're just, you're back into it. So I think doing the smallest amount that you can't fail is really important. And I would bring that in to bring it even slightly towards a military aspect. Um, this idea, let's say anything that I would have done um, in, the, in the military, a lot of my friends who'd be, who'd be full-timers in the army would talk about this idea, like that your, your focus, when you go, like, because you might be in, okay, let's say not for myself, but for some of the guys I would know, they would have maybe looked down the barrel of 15 months of training where they're essentially confined not always but essentially confined to barracks or you're being told what to do and if you're there on day one you think i've over a year to go like you go you'd go crazy you'd go mad like it's it's just it's such a long period of time that it's hard to conceptualize but if you take it day by day and even more specifically okay i'm getting to the next meal so yeah. that was that's a big coping thing that people in the irish defense forces if there's anyone listening they'll probably have a laugh at that it's <laughs> you get you're getting to your next you're getting to your next meal and it's the same, like you think about, like I, I wouldn't have a huge knowledge of the Navy SEALs, but I know <clears throat> there's a lot of that kind of, let's say, during the Hell Week that people might be familiar with. There's a lot of that, like the really small goal setting, um, getting to the next, okay, I'm going to finish, I just need to do, uh, you know, I just need to carry this boat 100 meters, then I'll have a little minutes, a minute's break. I'll have, you know, yeah. if I get to this meal time, I'll get an hour of sleep. And it's those tiny, you're sticking the smallest little goals that are achievable because you compound the effects of success. There was a famous example of this, and I, I, I can't remember the name or the source of it, but it was about a German, I think it was a German officer in the Second World War who got isolated somewhere very, very remote, could have been, could have been in Russia. And he traveled something like some crazy, um, you might have to check this out afterwards, but he traveled some crazy, crazy distance that, look, for probably for you or I, you wouldn't make it. Um, but his whole his mentality was i'm just going to get to that next hill yeah i'm going to get to that next hill and i'm going to get to that next hill so if you think about like and even look for my thesis you sit down and like that ended up being like a couple of hundred a couple of hundred pages and you're sitting at the start and if you said to me a year ago you're going to have to write 400 pages you'd say <laughs> how could i how could I pass? And you're like, Rob, you, you, you've, you've been down the academic route as well. You know, but the end product, if you were to say to yourself, you're going to write that, you'd be like, oh, there's no way. Yeah. Do you know, there's no yeah. way you think. And, and anyone who's done, I suppose, anything in, in, in academia it will, 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 will relate to that. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, oh, sorry. Go on. Go on. No, I was just going to say it's, it's this whole idea. Well, you chunk it down. You don't. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? You chunk it down to the smallest little parts. Get yourself the smallest little wins. Don't look to write a thousand words in a day. Look to mm. write a hundred words every half an hour because that's achievable. And if you can do that rate, a uh, hundred words every half an hour, like over the course of a full day, you've probably got more than, I don't know, again, my maths has let me down. Is that more than a thousand? <laughs> we'll say that it is. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's like, <laughs> yeah, we'll give it to me. But if you sit down, like it's like when I was doing that, that, that screen and I was thinking, oh, I'll just do a thousand now. And like by by five hundred, you're thinking, God, I'm wrecked now. Uh, all my focus is gone. Whereas if yeah. I had set the goal of five hundred, I might still do the same amount of the time. But like, oh, you know, I've hit five hundred. Joe, you know I could do another five hundred. Yeah, and there's the goal ticks down. So I think setting yourself set the smallest the smallest goal that you know you can achieve, and then scale it up. If you need to scale up, okay, I've done five hundred. Joe, you know I could definitely do seven hundred in that same same time frame without kind of without kind of burning out. Um, so I think that's that's a really useful little little a little mindset I suppose where you can orientate yourself. Yeah, geez, yeah, exactly. And I, I that was exact same for myself when I was going through the masters is that I like it was it was going to be eighteen months straight or, or twenty months straight, whatever it was. Uh, I think it was twenty months in the end. There was even more because of COVID. But basically, having that idea that you're going to have to like you're going to have to do it all anyway. 
but I wasn't, if I had, to, if I for one second started thinking about, oh, I have 20 more months here and I have 18 more months to do, it really kills it. But if you think about, all right, I get here till the end of September, I get to the end of October then, and you celebrate then each month, a little celebration, even if it's just reflection, all right, got through that, that flew by, the next one goes just mm. a bit quicker. And I think the same thing translates over if you're training. And I often, I love to do it to myself, sadistic as it is, but... <laughs> I do love to say, okay, I'll, I'll get this done here in the gym. And then just as I, if I'm going to go out the door, I'd say, I'll go on, I'll do one more here. I'll just do one more set of something else. And then I find myself, it adds up. It really does add up at yeah. the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year. Those little things make a huge difference. I think it's important for that as well. And it's actually something that I wanted to move on from, let's say, is from let's the mindset side of things is huge. But I think if you put yourself, like looking at mindset as well and looking at how it relates to resilience, do you ever look at like cold exposure, heat exposure, stuff like that? Maybe how that could be used about actually voluntarily putting yourself through tough times to help build resilience. Yeah, it, it, to be honest, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really know much about that now. To be honest with you, Robbie, but I, I it's something I've started actually doing the last week in the gym. I love, I love the sauna. Oh, yeah. and what I'll do is I'll come out and like I hate cold water. Gee, I hate it. I hate it. Hate it. Hate it. We started putting. I started putting my head under the cold, the the cold tap or the cold shower, and like gradually trying to increase the time and increase maybe you know how much more of the body that's actually getting hit by the whole the, the cold water. Mm. And I suppose, again, look, that might come up to the contextual, the contextual nature of resilience. So if you're training, uh, maybe for a specific, I don't know, cold water swimming you'll see this idea that people are, you know, the first time they might get into the, the sea, they're only able to do it for a minute. But yeah. after a year, they're able to swim around for half an hour or 10 minutes. I, I'm not sure what, what, what a good mark for that would be. So definitely in that kind of maybe from, if you're looking at resilience, maybe from like a physical hardiness point of view, um, that definitely in doing it kind of that way, definitely, uh, sorry, that there might be something in that. But I think like if you just, again, to take the, the conceptualization of resilience, um, of, you know, if you're able to overcome maybe uh, some challenges that you faced before, like, for example, if you're able to do a minute uh, in a, let's say, cold water bath, well, the next time if you do a minute and 10 seconds, the next time you go back and you do a minute, well, a minute feels grand. Do you know, yeah. it's, it's like your baseline is constantly, constantly uh, ticking up. Um so yeah, look, I wouldn't have a huge amount of knowledge in that, but like it makes it makes sense for that your resilience to that particular stimuli. Um, yeah. the more you work on it, um, it's like the more you're exposed to something, the less you react to it. Um, so look, if you're working, you know, it's like imagine starting a new job and the first day you find it very, very stressful. Let's say even if you're working in a restaurant in a kitchen, remember I used to work as a dishwasher, and the first day you're like, God, this is so busy, I'll never be able to do this. And then by the end of six months, you're like, grand, like the, the lunchtime rush is, is nothing. Your yeah. stress reactivity, your heart rate, all of that, your, your psychological arousal to that stimulus, let's say the lunchtime rush through habituation um, is, going to be, is going to be lower over time because you've built, again, it's this idea of the moving, your moving baseline is going up based on your experience and your challenges. Yeah, geez, yeah, no, that's, I wonder like that I, I would love to see or I would love to find out if it is like what what level or if there is because it's, it's very difficult to correlate or to even in it with anything in the body and I think it comes back to training as well like just because you're doing squats heavy squats in the gym doesn't mean that you're going to run faster it, 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 can, it can help it in some way but it doesn't mean that you're going to sprint faster so I'm wondering those improving your ability to tolerate cold exposure or voluntarily put yourself through uh, I guess a difficult time. Um, I know see, the thing I, th I think what I, I need to kind of flip my mind around is you, when you were looking at resilience, you were looking at resilience and its effect on mental health and then like post-traumatic offsetting post-traumatic stress disorder and stuff like that. Wasn't it? Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's way more down the line than going into a cold bath and, and then struggling away. So I can, I, I understand your, when you are talking about that, how it, the effect might be minimal in a way. It wouldn't be as yeah. big as what it would be. I think, look, it's 
if you talk about maybe comparing like ice baths to somebody maybe who might be exposed to trauma, I think that might be a little bit of a jump. But for yeah. people in their in their day to day life, if we're taking taking resilience back from, which I suppose is looking at resilience in the extreme when you're talking about PTSD trauma, like they're like you know end level uh, or not end level, but they're high level I suppose negative outcomes that can happen. But if we if we scale it back to somebody's maybe day to day, I think like the idea maybe of cold water, heat water, you know, and that, that you could basically conceptualize that maybe as somebody exposed themselves to discomfort yeah. um, or a bit of hardship. Like that's something the Irish army would talk about as well. Like, you know, embrace hardship is one of the, is one of the, the taglines. So maybe like, look, I, I think it's, 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 it's definitely possible that if you're somebody who sets yourself a challenge of longer, longer cold water exposures, God, that's very uncomfortable. That could maybe generalize to, even from a mindset point of view to other different things that might go on in your life. Like, God, like that's really tough doing that cold water exposure. And I've done that now and I'm improving over the last couple of weeks, but maybe that might have a knock on effect of a little bit of confidence and saying, yeah, yeah no, yeah. that's, that's something tough. Now that's a little challenge that I've overcome. Um, so maybe, and that gave you, it might give you a little bit more confidence. So then you take on a different challenge and work and you, you've completed that. Okay. That, yeah. I didn't think I was going to be able to do that. I've done that. That's a little bit more confidence. So it's like that co- compounding effect of success, I think, is important. So does like, will, you know, in, in, ex- exposure to that kind of hardship, is it going to make you more resilient directly? It'll make you more resilient to dealing with that particular uh, mm. type of stressor. But will it directly affect something else? I don't know. I don't know if there's any science behind that, but it might have indirect benefits is probably what I'd say. Okay. Okay. Yeah, geez, that's good. That's, that's interesting. I think what I what I what will 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 finish off uh, mm. on Cullum uh, is that I'd love to figure out from at the end of your research what was the conclusion, what did you come to, and just before we jump into that, it just popped into my head there. What is that? Uh, what would you say the difference is between resilience and coping, or is there any? So this is uh, how long do you have? Um, so I think <laughs> w- one of my <laughs> one of my uh, yeah one of my my thing is with resilience is we think of it as this single concept. And a lot of that is to maybe with how it's measured, like mm-hmm. things like the Connor Davidson resilience scale. And you do that scale and you're given a score on your resilience at that particular moment in time. But is resilience really one thing? Mm-hmm. I'd say no. I'd say resilience is humans. We like to conceptualize things, we like to put labels on things. Resilience, and then when you look at it, how it's measured, the different things that can, because resilience, the way it's defined is basically it's your ability to kind of like bounce back or adapt to novel stressors. So is that really one thing or is that one strategy that people are using to adapt to it? So coping skill or your coping abilities, like if you look at the umbrella term of resilience, it's a whole plethora of things that fall. It's a whole like conglomerate of factors that I suppose combined to give us what we would call this conceptualization of resilience so coping skill it's a huge it's a huge contributing factor to this idea of resilience um and it's kind of like look that's you can get into like the conceptual argument like your ability to cope is that your resilience but does coping skill does that include um maybe things like your iq or your upbringing it doesn't so they're not exactly the same okay. but if you're more resilient I suppose the idea is that you might be better able to cope with things that might happen. Um, I think the one thing we really said we might quickly come back to as well is this idea of the, the ethics of resilience, yeah. uh, building your resilience intervention. Just, I suppose it's an important point. A lot of the conceptualizations of resilience are this idea of the individual and being making the individual or it's an individualistic trait of resilience and something that came up with, with military. So if you're working in a military, there's some stresses and strains that regardless of how well the organization is run are never going to be gone like the navy being exposed to maybe some of the issues in the mediterranean even if it had the best organizational structure and the best maybe you know psychological supports you're not going to be able to take that stress away so for the way we looked at resilience the way we went on to develop the the ripstop resilience program it had to take i suppose to an extent that individualistic approach but if you then flip over to, uh, if you flip over then to um, 
maybe something in the health service, like say the NHS, let's say, let's clap for our heroes, which is, you know, it's a nice initiative. But that is putting maybe those kind of initiatives or those kind of view on resilience that, oh, our healthcare staff are so resilient. But is that putting all the onus on them to be resilient without maybe addressing the staffing issues or, you know, the crazy work hours that uh, yeah. healthcare staff might work? So that's an organizational stress that could be changed, uh, but isn't being changed. Then if somebody were training, then might come in with a resilience building program to make those people more resilient. Um, is that fair to put the, all the onus on those people? So now we're training them to be more resilient so they can put up with more stress, essentially in, in that kind of scenario. And then if something goes wrong or, Look, everyone, I think we talked about it. A lot of people will have their will have a breaking point. You look at special force from the Second World War, 98% uh, ended up with uh, some symptoms of post-traumatic stress after 60 days. Um, and we, you know, we talk about special forces as being like the elite. And even they, those people have the point uh, where they'll transition from mental health to maybe mental ill health. Uh, so when we talk about then somebody, let's say in the healthcare setting, they've gotten this resilience training and then they go on and they, they're struggling or they struggle with burnout or they might develop you know, anxiety or depression. Well, then is it from, because from the organizational point of view, well, we gave them the resilience training. So they're yeah. not resilient enough, but we haven't looked at the organizational factors. So that's kind of just an ethical debate that's going on in resilience. I think it's important to know. So is it just, we focus on making the individual more resilient or do we need to make the individual more resilient but also adapt the organization around that so it's not the same stresses going in. So I think that was just an important point that I wanted to get across. Great well. point, yeah, yeah, definitely. With the conclusion then of the study and when everything went through and you had the, like, you, you implemented the, uh, the program, how did, it, how did it turn out? What results did you get from it? Yeah, so it was, it was what we call, I suppose, a proof of concept trial. So we weren't looking at any sort of efficacy testing. We were basically seeing is this package, the Ripstop Resilience Training, Rips, Resilience Skills Training Program, Ripstop, um, was that something that could be delivered? Was, was it possible to deliver in the Defence Forces context? Um, would it be acceptable to personnel? Would they engage with it? Um, and then I suppose looking at that idea of reflection, after we've delivered it, we'll get the feedback from participants and we'll say, okay, what needs to change to make it potentially more effective down the line? Yeah. So... Basically, we took to, we looked at it from a knowledge and skills point of view, um, with the idea that we so we had like six modules so involved like there was a bit of psychoeducation at the start. So what is stress? What does stress look like? Uh, like for example, one of the things is we've all heard about the fight fight or flight response, but there's you know there's, I think it's actually it's fight flight freeze flag, and there's I think faint is another one. So it's actually it's more it's the 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 whole. Even that learning for our participants was something that they found interesting, that there's more reactions to stress maybe than just somebody getting all rage go or somebody freeze, you know, that there's more to it or, or, or running away. Um, so dealing with the skills, I suppose, to destigmatize that if something were to happen to them down the line um, or to one of their buddies, that they'd be able to identify it and say, oh, well, you know, he's, he's dealing with it in this way, but maybe that actually makes sense and he's not that he's not resilient. It's that yeah. his, his body is just a different physiological reaction to stress. Okay. We would have then, so that would have been a lot of the knowledge piece. And then it would have been the skills part. So using kind of maybe a CBT kind of paradigm to work through stress. So if you experience a traumatic event, this is how it might feel. This is how you might think these might be your emotions and understanding, I suppose, that network and how that can work. Um, they're definitely, then we looked at some mindfulness uh, skills training. So a bit of breath work, um, I suppose kind of the relaxation training almost um, just to re reduce that arousal afterwards and give people a bit of space to reflect. And then we would have had kind of the mental resilience skills training. So which would have been looking at different ways you can cope uh, communication styles. Um, then like what the transition from deployment to home was, I suppose I've spoken about that that can be tricky, what that might look like for you and how you can navigate that with your family. So yeah. I suppose the skills then I suppose how to tap into your social support. Uh, so that was kind of the conceptual idea. That's the way we looked at it from. So skills and knowledge, um, the evaluations, very, very preliminary stuff. Um, uh, we weren't looking at did it build resilience. It was run over two days um, just for, for just with COVID and everything we had to get it done. And just so we'd ensure we'd have the same participants 
uh, we just needed to get it done there and then. Uh, but really positive sign that was very well received uh, by our participants who were, were active active duty soldiers in the Irish Army. Um, so I think there's good scope. Definitely things to change uh, going forward. Um, we need to be a bit longer. Some of the skills-based work maybe uh, would need to be more elaborated on. Like, you know, mindfulness training itself could be an eight-week course and we did it in like an hour and a half. So yeah, yeah. For, for a next phase, all those things would need to be uh, extrapolated out. But that's the whole, that's all part of psychological science is, you know, you test it, you test it, see what works, see what doesn't work. And then you go on, you change. And I suppose that's like the idea we were talking about reflecting on, on, on things you've done or your own performance, see what was good, see what was bad. What can I change? And to focus on the good as well as the bad to, yeah. I suppose, develop the better product, be that yourself, be that your sports performance, be that your resilience. Excellent. Okay. That's good. Um, really, and I'm delighted to be honest, I think it's definitely something that, as you said, it's it's brought. There's so many avenues you could go down with it, and there's so many different. Uh, like with the way the research is at the moment, it seems that it's 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 fairly it's coming at it from all angles, and there's good, and mm-hmm. positive, and negative, and all that. But the fact that you're you're digging into it, and I think it, for the people that you're working with, it's exactly when you're looking at long term effects. Like it's 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 the people who need it most. Um, I think that's great to see it, and I I, I have to say the fact that you were saying the highlighting it of it and the education side of things i think that's most important because it's easy to give people coping mechanisms and, and, and different skills that they can use but unless they understand why they have to do it what's the reason behind it it's it's very difficult because when do they know when to implement it but um mm, that's true i i think uh I, we'll, we'll we'll leave it at that for now I've, I've held you for long enough um so thanks a million um Colum, i really really appreciate it and I, i'd love to get you on again um, Super, at, Robbie. Yeah, it's brilliant. at a later date uh, but first off I suppose what I'll say is in in a minute or in, in two minutes what what would you leave uh, with people um, at the end of this when it comes to resilience when it comes to mindset is there anything that you'd say that people need to look at this or you should maybe focus on this a small bit more in your life side or have you ever come across anything that you that was an eye-opening experience for you on that journey uh, for the PhD yeah, look, I think and a lot of it's come up. I think your social support network and not being afraid to talk to those yeah, close around you, I think is, is so, so important. Problem shared is a problem halved. So if you're dealing and it can be dealing with anything from stress and work, uh, it can be, you know, uh, lifestyle or anything like that, your gym, whatever. If you're having trouble with something, talk to somebody else because you don't know what other people's experience is, what challenges they've overcome in their life. Um, and what coping skills are, are techniques they've used. Uh, so I think that's really important. Two, two heads are better than one. Um, so don't be afraid to talk to people. If you're struggling with anything, be that mental health or being with just things in work or you know, anything, any, anything in your day to day. I think that's really important. Other things, I suppose, the idea that resilience isn't, you're not resilient, you're not resilient. Okay. And it's going to fluctuate up and down through your life. Uh, so I think that's a really positive thing. And Times maybe when you feel you're not as resilient, be compassionate for yourself. Resilience isn't the be all and end all. It's going to change for everyone. Um, it's that's what's that that idea, the, the, the dynamic conceptualization of resilience. So have compassion for yourself. Um, and don't be afraid to take on uh, other challenges or push yourself. I think we talked about the compounding effect of success. Don't be afraid to push your boundaries and what you think you can achieve. Because the more you achieve, when any other maybe lesser stresses come up in your life, you've developed your coping skills, you've developed your techniques, and you're going to find them easier to deal with. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for that, Dr. Colin Doody, which I think is great to be able to call you now. <laughs> um, and just before this this cuts out, uh, where can people find you if they want to ask any questions? Is- yeah, Twitter at Colin Doody. It's Colin Doody on LinkedIn as well. And then I have a new Instagram page. It's at the resilience underscore. No, it's the underscore resilience underscore doctor, which is DR. Uh, so nice. if you want to find me on that. And any questions, uh, fire away. Excellent. Come on. Thanks a million for that. Bobby, thanks very much. No problem at all.